This is The Journey of Little Charlie by Christopher Paul Curtis, Chapter 3, Snared. Oh, getting a little delay here. It was hard telling one day from the next. The only thing that the only thing that kept me and Ma from losing our minds is working in the fields. Whilst everything else around us was changing and hard to think about, the fields was always the same, always something you could count on. Things got turned upside around. Instead of looking forward to sunset, I wish the sun would get stuck right at noon and stay there because the fields was the only time I didn't start thinking about Pat's undoing. <coughs> I don't remember exactly how long it was. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly how long it was before I answered a knock at the door and was surprised to see Sheriff Jackson standing on the porch. Morning, Sheriff. Morning, little Charlie. The Sheriff looked me up and down. I noticed the other day you done growed a lot, boy. Yes, sir. He grabbed my arm and whistled. You stronger than most full-grown men, ain't you? I don't think so, sir. Big as your arm is, it wouldn't take much for you to knock down a small tree with one swing, would it? I ain't never tried, sir. Yup, as big as your arms is, I bet it wouldn't. Most times when someone's talking about how grown and strong I look, I have to fight not to smile nor blush. Them things just ruins a ruins the growed picture of me that my size paints and I and show I ain't nothing but a kid. But something about all these questions the sheriff was batting against me felt different. Smiling nor blushing wasn't nowhere in my mind. Sheriff Jackson said, Little Charlie, I hope you won't mind riding along and showing me the place in the woods where this tragedy befell your pa. The uneasiness that was churning around in my belly started making itself heavy. Me and Pap had rode out miles before he spotted the maple tree and it'd be perfect for finishing the cabinet we'd been working on for months for Mr. Dalton. Then it hit me. We'd gone so far out that the tree Pap picked must have been on the Tama planta Tana plantation. Sheriff Jackson, sir, I swear on my ma's head that we didn't know we was stealing no one's wood. Pap would never do nothing to rile up Mr. Tanner. We seen the whoopings he give to folks who's poached on his land. Pap wouldn't do nothing to cross him. That was a swear for God truth. Pap had had a bad time out at the Tanners with their overseer, Captain Buck, who was that man that done the whoopings. We was all forced to watch. Word would get sent out that everyone from all around the county needed to come to the Tanner plantation and watch a cap tear the hide off of some poor farmer who, who was accused of shooting one of the Tanners deers or pheasants or fishing in the stream that run across their land. Pap said as harsh as Captain Buck was on the white farmers near the Tanner plantation, he was even worse on the slaves that dared cross him. The sheriff grabbed my arm again and said, This ain't about no wood stealing, boy. You best just come along with us. Us? I followed the sheriff out the front door and there was five mounted men waiting on me. Petey the Dimwit was one of them, and he was holding onto one of the reins of one of the, of the old riderless mare. This was a posse. A sad little one, but if you've seen the posse before, it ain't hard to recognize one the second time around. I said, I can go get Spangler and ride him, sir. The sheriff said, well, little Charlie, if it ain't no trouble, why don't you climb up on next to Petey? Now, there was no doubt this wasn't about stealing wood. Why else would they have a posse already brung together? Why else would they think I was going to try to run off and give me a lame horse so as I couldn't? My legs turned to stone. What if the punishment for stealing lumber wasn't getting whooped? What if it was to get hung? I looked for a way out, but there wasn't going to be no escaping. The sheriff was smarter than he was letting on. I'd fallen into his snare. The way the posse was lined up had the sheriff on the, and the other men up front and me and Petey riding abreast in the middle whilst the other two men trailed behind. Petey wouldn't look at me in the eye whilst I climbed up on the horse's back. Me and him had us a falling out a while afore, and he was still vexed. I give the reins to a tug to pull him out from his hands, but Petey snatched him back. 
He yelled, he's trying to bust loose, Sheriff Jackson. Can't one of y'all just go ahead and wound him? The sheriff said, he ain't trying nothing, Petey. You remember what I said. We's all got a job here, and you ain't nothing but to hold on to them reins. Petey was real disappointed. He said in that whining, sing-song voice of his, well, couldn't I just shoot him in the foot and we wouldn't have to worry about him running at all? The sheriff clumbed down from his horse and come back to Petey. Now you look here, Petey Timmons. You ain't got no pistol, do you? I told you, Ma, you could ride along only if you wasn't carrying no weapon. Petey reached in his coat pocket and pulled out this old six-shooter. He passed it down to the sheriff. The only thing on it that wasn't rusty was the wood grips. Sorry, sheriff. Don't say nothing to Ma. She don't know I brung it. She don't even know I got one. The sheriff uh, looked the gun over. Seen it didn't have no bullets and that the trigger was so rusty it wouldn't budge. He handed the piece of rust back to Petey. Sheriff Jackson winked at me and said, Listen here, Petey, you got to promise me if little Charlie do try bolting, you got to throw that six shooter at him as hard as you can. That set the other man off to guffawing and chuckling. Petey laughed right along with him, never knowing the joke was on him. I showed him which way to head out. For the next four miles that we was riding into the forest, my mind didn't come off in the hangman's noose once. The everything I ever remembered about folks hanging someone was running through my head o'er and o'er, including the hanging of Jesse Huddleston that Mr. Tanner had made everyone come see. After a while, the sheriff said, you sure this is the right way, boy? It ain't far from here, sir. Can't no one blame us for not knowing the Tanner Plantation come out this far, can they? No, nah, little Charlie, I done told you this ain't got nothing to do with no lumber stealing. From my reckoning, this here engine land, just hesh up. The feeling of relief that sprung up in my heart didn't rest there more for more than a beat or two, because if what the sheriff was saying was true, why was I being rode out here in the middle of a posse? I sink the maple from about a hundred yards off. I swallowed hard and said, it happened right up there, sure. Right up there, Sheriff Jackson. The words is a bell tolling my posse, which had got more tighter and more draggish with each mile we rode that perked up right and proper. The two men that was following stopped slouching in their saddles and watched me sharp-eyed. Petey held onto the barrel of his pistol and shook it at me like it was a hatchet, ready to cleave me clean in half. We got to the tree and tears started welling up in my eyes. Pap's blood was still pooled up on the ground where he followed. The sheriff turned in his saddle and said, okay, little Charlie, tell me once more again about what happened to your pa. I was beginning to think that the reputation the sheriff had amongst folks was wrong. Word is he's a good, honest, and mostly smart man, but to me, he was showing signs of being a bit slow. This must have been the third time he asked me to tell him what happened to Pap. I was real patient when I told him again. Pat picks out this here maple as a perfect size and age. He got the big ax and sent me to pull some hand saws off in the spangler for trimming. I stops for a second to see how far Pat's gonna drive that ax in with his first blow. Ma says the way Pat swings his ax is one of them things that makes life worth going through. Says she probably would have never married Pop if Pat if she hadn't run across him in the woods hacking hunks out of trees. Once, she felt how the earth shook after Pat tore into a tree. She didn't have no choice but to marry him, according to her, which is peculiar, but what that grown folks do ain't. I told the sheriff, Pat raises the ax up, slides his right hand along the handle, takes two practice swings, and then slams the ax at the tree like he's gonna knock it over to the next district. That had been when time started moving slow so slow that I didn't have no choice but to watch near everything. I told the sheriff, the ax whistled as Pat swung it at the tree, the sun hit it, and it wasn't nothing but a flashing silver blur. But then my breath got snagged in my throat. Go on, boy. Then the ax hit the tree. Instead of making that good solid booming chunk it always made previous, Pat's ax made the same sound the blacksmith does when he's using his hammer to bang a hot shoe on an anvil. Then the tree done the dangest thing. Pap hit it so hard that it squeals and throws a ball of sparks and fire like it was about to burst out into flame. The sheriff who'd been listening and nodding his head butted me off. Right there, little Charlie, 
right there is one of them things that don't make no sense. I ain't saying you're lying, boy, but how in tarnation is a tree going to throw sparks? I don't know, sir. It just did. Then the axe handle come live. It shakes and cracks into long skinny splinters. Pack screams and his hands come flying off the handle like it had turned itself into a lightning bolt. I ain't never afore heard Pat cry out from hurting, even with his left little toe and the one next to it got sawed off by Doc without no, no, no kind of numbing and Pap hadn't made a peep. Pap's cry was powerful, disturbing memory, disturbing and fresh. It was part of what was making me jump out of my sleep. It made me wish I was deaf. I think we're just going to finish the chapter. The tears started fighting their way back in my eyes, but I wasn't about to let the dim wet and them other men see me cry. I took a deep breath and pretended I was about to cough. Then, sir, the head of the axe bounced off that maple clean and crisp, as flat as a stone skipping off a pond. It kissed itself up off Pat's forehead with a horrible sound, then whistled off into the woods. Sheriff Jackson said, it's important that we find that axe head boy. Which way did it go? I didn't see where it went, sir. All I seen was how Pap's backbone went ramrod stiff, standing him straight as a soldier. He froze that way for a bit, then keeled over backward, the same way a rotted old hunter, rotted out hundred year old oak would. Didn't nothing bend on him. He just falled straight back like his foot's hinged to the ground. Then what? That was all, sir. I put Pap across Spangler's back and rode as fast as I could back to Possum Moat. The sheriff jumped out, jumped at my, jumped my talking one more time. That, that's another one of them things that just causes questions to be raised, boy. You say you and your pa was out here alone? Yes, sir. You and your ma didn't range for no one to be waiting in the trees? What? Waiting in the trees? No, sir, why would we? Explain this to me then, little Charlie Bobo. Big Charlie, may his soul rest in peace, was six and a half feet tall, weighed 350 pounds if he weighed an ounce. Ain't no doubt he's huge for your age, but folks is having the turbulence time seeing how a 12-year-old boy is going to lift that much dead weight, especially how you can lift your paw high enough to lay him across the back of a horse. That's a job for at least two men, two big strapping men. It had never crossed my mind. I can't say for sure. All I know is when I heard Pat cry out, I then seen him still and quiet on the ground, staring into the heavens. Something came over me. I got so scared and worried that I had done anything to help him, sir. So I bent over, picked him up. He didn't weigh nothing to me. Even if Spangler wasn't there, I could have run all four miles back with him in my arms. The sheriff said to the three men in PD, Y'all get on down from them horses and start looking around for that axe head. He turned back to me. This time when he talked, he'd quit being so mad at me. Son, you got to understand why we got questions about what happened out here. There wasn't no witnesses, and, well, to be blunt, word's going around that your pa had come into some money and was fixing to run off to Cincinnati with... The sheriff looked mighty discomfited. Well, with someone who wasn't your ma. You saying you didn't know nothing about that? It wouldn't have been more, no more surprising if Spangler spread her wings and flew off to scare mice under the Queen of England's chair. Pap running off to somewhere called Seen Seen Addy? The sheriff seen his words knocked me into, knocked me into a co cocked hat. He said, we, we also heard there was some sharp talk and some blows passed twixt your mom and pa at the Tanner store in past weeks. What was it that you got your ma so vexed at him? He was right. Ma was sore disappointed that the store wouldn't give us no more credit until we paid down on what we owed. She started going to Pat about how come he ain't been paying what he was supposed to and how close us and our animals was to starving and how she shouldn't have never married him. Yes, sir, Ma was right vexed with him. I didn't have no feelings one way or the other. I know it's best than to put my nose in grown folks business. The sheriff said, little Charlie, you put them things together and even Petey thinks it's fishy that your pa was killed right after him and your ma near come to blows, especially out here in the wilderness, with no one to say what really happened. What really happened? How plug stupid could I be? 
The sheriff was fitting my neck for the noose, all right, but it wasn't for stealing none of Mr. Tanner's lumber. He was looking to prove I'd murdered my own Pat. There wasn't a whole lot of talking done when the posse took me home, but the sheriff did make Petey turn loose the reins of the lame mare I'd rode out and given to me. I guess if I got the urge to bust loose now, me and the lame mare could waddle and limp our way into the woods. When we got to our cabin, the sheriff said, okay, little Charlie, I want Judge Bird to go out with me and look at that area. Y'all ain't planning on going nowhere, are you? Where would we go? In all my 12 years, I'd never been more than 10 miles from Possum Moan. No, sir, we ain't got no plans but to get back into the fields. Good boy, little Charlie. Tell your mom we'll be getting back with y'all. Yes, sir. Goodbye, sir. Judge Bird was known as the smartest man in the county. He quit being a judge so he could be so as he could do all Mr. Tanner's courthouse work for him. My only hope was that he'd find something that would clear my name and keep me from swinging from a limb with a stretched neck and tied up feet. A week crawled past after Sheriff Jackson and his posse took me to the woods, and in that time, me and Ma and Stanky done just as I told him we was gonna and spent all our time in the fields. It was getting near harvesting time and we couldn't waste one minute else we might not get the crops in. That's where we'll stop.